So hi, I'm Rahul, and I'll be talking about why constant depth formula and partial function versions of MCSP are hard. So let me begin by telling you roughly how this talk will go. Uh, so I'll start off by describing some background on MCSP. I'll define what it is and why I think it's interesting. Then I'll go into the hardest results that are proved in the paper. And finally, I'll end with an application uh, of some of these techniques to constant depth formulas. Okay, so let's start. So what is MCSP? So MCSP stands for the minimum circuit size problem. And the problem takes two inputs. The first is the truth table, the Boolean function. That's just the list of all the values a function takes on all of its inputs. And this is some string and, uh, that you can use as input and it's gonna have length uh, two to the little n. So because it's all the values the function takes on all of its inputs. And then you're also going to get a size threshold s, and this is just some positive integer. And the output of this problem is going to be, does there exist a circuit that at most s wires computing this function? Now, to be totally formal here, I need to define exactly what type of circuits I'm talking about here. I won't be so precise right now, but you can just think of the usual types of circuits with AND or NOT gates and FAN and two. So one thing that should be relatively easy to observe based on this definition is that MCSP is an MP. So if I want to witness a yes instance to MCSP, what I can do is hand over a circuit and you can go in and check, does it have S, S wires and does it compute this function on all of these inputs in the truth table? On the other hand, we know that MCSP is probably not MP. It turns out that if one-way functions exist, this problem cannot be easy. And so this sets up this dichotomy where that suggests that maybe MCSP is NP hard. And that's kind of gonna be the motivation for this talk uh, and motivation for this research is like whether MCSP is NP hard. So that's what MCSP is. I, I want to say a little bit about why people care about MCSP. And so I think the primary reason people are so interested in MCSP is the connections the problem has. It has these connections to other areas like cryptography and learning theory, and average case complexity. And what's kind of interesting is that these connections are related to like basic uh, aspects of MCSP's com complexity. Like for example, is the problem NP complete? We don't know. Is it hard to approximate? We don't know. Can you beat the naive brute force algorithm? These are all very basic questions about the complexity of MCSP and we, that we don't know the answer to. What we do know is that answers to each of these questions would have significant ramifications on say structural complexity, average case complexity and circuit complexity. So for example, we have theorems of the following form. If something is true about MCSP, then that implies to a solution, that implies a solution to a longstanding open problem in some of these areas. So for example, if we do MCSP was NP complete under the usual type of reductions, polynomial time, many one, we'd get a breakthrough complexity class separation. If we knew an approximation to MCSP is NP complete, then by theorem of Hirahara, we get a worst case to average case reduction on the complexity of MCSP. And finally, if you can show that MCSP does not have at least super efficient circuits, uh, for some specific version of MCSP, then you get a really powerful lower bound like that NP does not have polynomial size circuits. So this is like a hardness magnification phenomena where like a weak looking lower bound on a specific problem implies a really strong lower bound on a whole complexity class. So that's kind of what uh, makes, the, makes MCSP so, so interesting to study. I wanna come back to this specific question of whether MCSP is NP hard. And so this is a longstanding open question. And you know, it, it said that Levin actually delayed publishing his version of the Cook-Levin theorem because he wanted to show that MCSP was also NP hard. And since then we don't we don't really have much progress in terms of understanding formally whether or not MCSP is NP hard. And so why have we not been able to prove MCSP is NP hard? Well, the primary reason is that if you look at the difficult no instance of MCSP, what they correspond to are functions requiring large circuits. And so what that means is if you're designing a reduction from SAT, say SAT to MCSP, 
you're going to have to, like, your reduction is going to kind of have to know about difficult no instances on CSP. And it's going to have to map difficult no instances of SAT to functions requiring large circuits. And we don't really know how to come up with functions requiring large circuits, at least deterministically. And so you can formalize this intuition. And there are actually formal statements that kind of suggest that deterministic polynomial time reductions from SAT to MCSP will require a breakthrough. And so what does this mean in terms of proving MCSP is NP hard? Does it mean like that maybe this isn't the, that maybe, maybe we don't have the tools yet to try and attack this problem? Well, at least for me, I see there's kind of like two escape routes here. For one, this polynomial time part, like what if we strengthen our assumption to ETH? Then can we show that MCSP is not in P? If you, if you look at uh, what happens there, instead of all of a sudden us having to come up with functions requiring like really large circuits, all of a sudden we can get away with functions that just require linear size circuits, which is something we know how to prove. So it's not clear like if there's a barrier to showing, say, ETH implies MCSP is not in P. Another thing is randomized reductions. If you give, allow yourself randomness, then all of a sudden it becomes very easy to, to come up with functions requiring large circuits, just pick a random function. So that's another question. Like, Maybe using randomness, we could quite easily show that MCSP is NP hard. And finally, I just want to mention the intuition I've given here is that basically we don't understand general circuits. So that's what makes it hard to uh, prove hardness for MCSP. And there's actually a result from the late 70s that said, like, if we switch to a class that we understand, like DNF formulas, we can actually show that it's NP hard. And, uh, that's, that's kind of a direction that I've taken. I'll take in this work and I'll talk about it a little bit later, which is proving hardness for MCSP for restricted classes of circuits. And finally, I want to talk about a motivation I have in proving some of these hardness results for versions of MCSP and the implications for what that can be for circuit lower bounds. So Kind of one thing that you can observe is that if you look at the techniques we have for proving lower bounds, circuit lower bounds, they produce circuit lower bounds that are kind of easy to recognize. And what do I mean by that? It means that if like you look at the truth table, it's kind of very easy to tell, oh, okay, this is actually a hard function. Like it's yeah, that's yeah, that's a hard function. And this is very closely related to the natural proofs barrier of Rasdorf and Rudich. But on the other hand, if you want to prove hardness for MCSP, what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to come up find no instances of MCSP where the circuit lower bound is kind of hard to recognize. And, and that's because like your reduction should actually like discover hard no instances of MCSP so that like you don't put P in NP by accident. And so what on the whole that suggests is that proving hardness for MCSP requires lower bounds of maybe a different flavor than the ones we usually know how to prove. And I just want to emphasize that this is like, this is not like an extremely formal intuition, but my take on it is that perhaps looking at how to prove hardness for MCSP could, could be helpful on the front of proving circuit lower bounds. So what results uh, do I have regarding MCSP? So there's two hardness results. Hopefully it's clear from the title. So the first one is with regards to partial functions. What if you consider MCSP is instead of on total functions, but on partial functions? And the second thing is, what if we restrict our model down to the constant depth formula model? Like, can we prove hardness for this? So now let me just talk about these in a little bit more detail. So what is partial function MCSP? So again, you get two inputs. The second input is the same, just some size threshold. But now you're getting the truth table of a partial function as input. And so this is a list of values the function takes and all of its inputs. So like some of these things are now going to be stars. And what I want to stress, one thing I want to stress here is that like this is a full truth table. Like even if the function is only defined on say one input, this is still going to be of length two to the n here. It's not like some succinct way of representing this partial function. And the output is going to be, does there exist a circuit with at most s wires impeding this function? One thing that I want to note is that at least historically, this has been the somewhat important uh, intermediate problem. So like in the DNF M MCSP hardness result, for example, the real hardness result is actually proved by first reducing say SAT to this MCSP on partial functions problem, 
and then reducing the partial function version to the total function version. So at least historically, this has been uh, an interesting problem to study in terms of understanding the complexity of MCSP. So the theorem we showed is that under ETH, this problem cannot be in P. In particular, it can't, even be, it can't be solved in this barely super polynomial amount of time. So recall n here is the length of the input. And in fact, what we proved is a stronger statement that if you're given a partial functions truth table, even determining whether it's computed by read once formula cannot be done in polynomial time under ETH. So what are the key ideas used in our proof? So the main circuit lower boundary technique we use is gate elimination. And in fact, like a, a sort of twist on gate elimination. So usually in gate elimination, what you have is like you have this function G, which is a restriction of F. And you're saying, you say, well, if I have a circuit of size N for F, say, and I eliminate a gate and get a, a circus, then I can get a smaller circuit that competes this restriction. And what reverse gate elimination does is, is it kind of uses this process in reverse. It says, OK, maybe if I have this function f, which has g as a restriction, then I can kind of understand the circuits of f. I can understand what they look like based on understanding my understanding of the circuits for g. So in particular, in our result, what we do is we set g equal to a function who we, that we understand the circuits of very well, so just the or function on n, on n inputs. And what that means is that because this function f is has this restriction, what that means is that because this function f has a restriction equal to the or function, uh, there's some way we can understand what the optimal circuits for f look like, and that that kind of structural understanding is what enables our proof. And the other key idea is that we that we use this problem that uh, LMS proved was hard under ETH. 2n by 2n bipartite permutation independent set. And actually, this is like a really nice problem for us to reduce from in order to show hardness. OK, what about our constant depth formula result? So depth D formula in CSP is defined as follows. The input is the same, which is you get a truth table and you get a size threshold. But now the output is, does there exist a depth D formula with at most s, y, s leaves computing this function? Now, so there's been some work on this front that I've already mentioned in terms of like proving hardness for versions of MCSP that are on different circuit models. So I already mentioned that the DNF version of MCSP was proved NP hard in the late 70s. And just recently, I guess about two years ago, Hirohara, Oliver, and Sankanam showed that if you allow for yourselves XOR, XOR gates at the bottom, that problem is still NP hard. And so what we show is that for all constant d, uh, I should mention here, there's kind of like this constant d that lies outside of the definition of this problem. It's like some fixed, fixed constant d. Uh, we show that for all constant d greater than or equal to 2, that this problem is NP hard, and specifically under randomized quasi-polynomial time Turing reduction. So what are the key ideas behind this proof? Well, the first key idea is to use induction. Um, this is, this, this is like a fairly natural approach, I think. So you start with your NP-hardness results for D and F MCSP, something we already knew was NP-hard. And you just lift up from there. You show, you show that depth 3 MCSP is NP-hard, depth 4 MCSP is NP-hard, and so on. And the key way that we're able to get this inductive step to work, I mean, that's really the heart of our proof, is that we have this technique where we're able to lift lower bounds against depth D formulas into lower bounds against D plus one formulas. And so th this technique, uh, I'm going to describe a little bit more in the application that I'll talk about next. OK, so now we're going to talk about our application, which involves large gaps in formula complexity between depths. So I just want to review the model of constant depth formulas before I state these results. So the constant depth formula model, you know, you get a rooted tree of constant depth. Your internal nodes are lab labeled by AND or OR gates, which are allowed to have unbounded fan in. And like we can say that, that all the NOT gates are pushed to the bottom. And the complexity measure on constant depth formulas is 
that we're going to use is we're going to say the depth D complexity of F is the minimum number of leaves in a depth D formula computing F. So the question uh, this application is concerned with is what is the power of having extra depth additively? So in particular, if you have some function F, how large can the difference between F's depth D formula complexity and F's depth D plus one formula complexity be additively? So if you look at depth two and depth three, it's actually really easy to show that this quantity can be really large. It could be as big as omega two to the n. And at parity, for example, witnesses this. And in fact, you can get even better functions than parity. But what about higher depths? What if you want to talk about depth three versus four and so on? So as far as I know, the best result uh, that we knew up to this point was comes from the depth hierarchy theorems of uh, Hostad. And he showed that there exist functions such that their depth D formula complexity is exponential, but their depth D plus one formula complexity is linear. So in particular, uh, he proved a gap like this. And in fact, it was stronger because it's not just an additive gap, it's just this, this, this linear versus exponential. And so our result shows that you can actually do get an exponentially better dependence on D here. In fact, in particular, we show there exists functions such that the gap between their depth D and D plus one complexity, formula complexity, uh, is this large. And now before I go on and talk a little bit more about this result, I want to say mention some caveats. One, our results purely existential, like the construction of this works by pick, involves picking a random function. Another thing is that I, I only know how to prove this for formulas. I don't know how to prove it for circuits. And finally, it's just an additive gap. So the functions that I can prove to witness this gap actually have like a constant ratio between these two quantities. So it's really an additive gap. It's kind of a different character uh, than uh, the one in Hostad's depth hierarchy results. So what makes this result interesting, at least at least to me, I just I'll, I'll just restate the theorem here. I think one, this is kind of a parameter regime we didn't really understand very well uh, before and now, when this uh, when this dependence on d here is now uh, not in the second exponent. But I also want to come back to this idea I mentioned earlier about kind of different flavors of lower bounds and how understanding MCSP might lead us to different types of lower bounds. And to me, this feels like a different flavor of lower bounds. One, because it's like a really existential result. I, I, I really don't know how to even like in a huge, in huge classes, be able to make this function explicit. And also like, it's not clear to what extent this lower bound fits into the natural proofs barrier. For example, it's not clear whether random functions have this type of gap. They could have this type of gap. Um, we know that there, the ratio between these two quantities for random functions tends to our, towards one as when d is greater than or equal to three, but we don't know like additively whether these two quantities are far apart for random functions. So how, is, how do we go about proving this theorem? Again, just restating the theorem. So for the depth two and three cases, we just use the prior results. You can use the existing depth hierarchy results. What's interesting is in the depth four case and greater, what we do is we take uh, the inductive step of having a function that has a depth D versus D plus one gap and creating a new function H, which will have a depth D plus one versus D plus two gap. And, and what we pay is some constant in the exponent here each time we lift it up. So the main idea is this kind of inductive step. So what's the idea behind the inductive step? So we want to lift gaps to larger depths. So what does that mean? We start with some function f that has a large d versus d plus 1 gap. And now we want to come up with a function h, which has a large d plus 1 versus d plus 2 gap. So it turns out, based on some De Morgan law tricks that are not too complicated, it suffices to consider formulas with an or gate on top. And once you restrict to this or top gate, it turns out you can describe h pretty easily 
So the process is going to be as follows. So f is some function on n inputs. So what we're going to do is pick some function g on two n inputs. And then we're going to set h equal to the direct sum of f and g. So in particular, we're going to make a two independent variables. So these are variables. These are disjoint variables. And we're going to let this function h be equal to f on x and it with g on y. And kind of the idea here is, well, if you have an or, or top gate, then if you're trying to compute h, you kind of naturally want to use an AND gate to compute h. Yeah, but the top gate's an OR gate, so you're kind of like losing that top layer of depth. It's like not very helpful for you. And so that's like taking you from making depth d plus 1 look more like depth d. And in particular, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to state like the result we've proved about h. And to do that, I'm going to need this notation. I'm going to say that L, L OR sub d plus 1 of f is the minimum number of leaves in OR top depth d plus 1 formula for f. And our theorem is that the complexity of h, its depth d plus 1 complexity, can be lower bounded in terms of the d plus, d plus 1 complexity of g. So that's kind of like the uninteresting part of the lower bound. But what's super interesting is that it's lower bounded by the depth d complexity of f. So the d plus 1 complexity of h is kind of closely related, is lower bounded by the depth d complexity of f plus this other term. And so how tight is this? Well, a very naive upper bound you can get on h is like, how hard is it to compute with a depth d formula with an AND gate on top? Like you can forget about your top layer of depth and then like how hard is it to compute? And so you can very easily get this upper bound that's been most the depth d complexity of f plus the depth d plus d complexity of g. And so the first two terms in these bounds are the same. So uh, all the slackness comes between these two uh, terms. And it turns out that for at least for random functions, these two quantities, their d plus 1 complexity and their d complexity, are actually very close together after you get past depth 3. In fact, the ratio between them tends towards 1. So if you, uh, you kind of, it turns out to get the result that I stated previously, like this gap result, you don't want to choose this function g completely at random. You want to choose it such that the difference between these two quantities is small relative to uh, the quantity you're interested in, or, or the depth d complexity of f, so that like you could kind of lift this depth d complexity of f to depth d plus 1 without getting too much loss from this bound. But um, yeah, that, this is, that's the main idea behind the theorem. We, we check, choose some function g mostly at random, and then we take its direct sum. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I put my email here. And uh, yeah. <laughs>